Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hoop. This is our regular weekly message. And today's message is entitled, Selling Your Birthright. But someone might say, ah, oh, Brother Kenny, I don't have a birthright to sell. I don't even have an inheritance. This message is not for me. Well, I'm here to tell you today that you have more than you realize. You not only have a birthright, but you have a birthright, an inheritance, a future, and a great, great hope. And it's all found in Christ Jesus. Listen to what God said in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Even when God is disciplining us, His thoughts are, His thoughts towards us are providing a hope for us, providing us with a future. All God's thoughts are pleasing and pleasant towards each and every one of us because it is not His will that any should perish, but all come to repentance and gain eternal life. That is why He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us, each one of us. That is why He gave us an inheritance in Jesus. Our inheritance is found in Christ Jesus, because it was Christ Jesus who died for us. God loves us more than we know. So never ever make the mistake to even begin to consider that God is against you or that He's not for your best interests. I'm telling you, God loves you more than you even realize, than you will ever, ever know. Just like an earthly father will discipline his children, so God will discipline us in our times of rebellion, in times when we need it. But it's not because He hates us. It's not because He wants to punish us, but so that we can learn and that we can, can come out of our ignorance and come into His blissful will. Because it is His will that is best for us. So if you can check that in Proverbs chapter 3 and Hebrews chapter 12, it tells us, that God only disciplines us for our own good. You see, God has great plans for each one of us. He has great plans for you. He has great plans for me, for our families. But we must be disciplined and not running wild and out of control. We can't be craving and gullible, chasing after fame and fortune and getting caught up in the things of this world. You must take care about the things that God cares about. You must value the things that God values. Our message today is entitled, Selling Your Birthright. Turn with me please to our scripture, Genesis chapter 25, verse 29 through 34. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore his name was called Edom. Jacob said, Sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me now. So he swore to him, and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Well, first of all, first off, I want to clear up some erroneous teachers right from the start. See, there are pastors who get up and proclaim from the pulpit that Jacob stole Esau, Esau's birthright or that he tricked him out of it or that he deceived Esau out of his birthright. But that is a 
bald-faced lie, which makes them, in the words of President Joe Biden, You're a lying dog-faced pony soldier. They have just defamed the apple of God's eye. Esau came in from the field exhausted. That old boy was so hungry that his belly thought his throat was cut. He was that famished. He felt like he couldn't make it another step if he didn't get something to eat right there and then. So Jacob, being the astute businessman that he was, presented his brother with a deal. The price of stew had just gone up. It was now selling at the cost of a birthright. You don't have to buy it, mind you, but if you want it, it will cost you. It was not trickery. It was not deceit. It was good old-fashioned astuteness and negotiation. Donald Trump and the journalist Tony Schwartz calls it the art of the deal. Now, if they claim that Jacob took advantage of the situation, okay, I can see that. But deceit and trickery? No way. That is too far of a stretch for me. That now fringes on the slander. If Jacob was alive today, he would have a huge liable lawsuit against all those who have callously maligned him. I want us to take a look at the conversation between Jacob and his brother Esau one more time. Genesis chapter 25, verse 30 through 34. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. He said he was famished, he was hungry, he was starving. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Jacob said, sell me your birthright. <laughs> That's plain to understand. Sell me your birthright. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. After he ate, he didn't even feel a little bit of repentance. Like, maybe this stew had costed me too much. Maybe I, 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 I want to give it back. I want to return this stew, although I don't know how he could do that. And I want my birthright back. I want, he, he arose and he went on his way. Esau asked for some of Jacob's stew. Some of that, give me some of that red stew. Jacob answered Esau, sure, but it will cost you your birthright. Esau replied, what good is a birthright if I'm not going to die of hunger? You can have it. I don't really need it if I'm dead. So give me some stew. Let me eat. Let me go on my way and you can have the birthright. Just give me some of your stew. Esau had a choice. He knew exactly what it was he was doing. He knew exactly what he was giving up and what he was getting in exchange for his birthright. It was not trickery. It was not deceit. He was not going to die if he did not eat right then and there. He could have said, nah, brother, your stew is way too expensive. It's good, but it's not that good. But Esau, instead, he said, that sounds good to me, brother. I'll take that deal. And that is how he despised his birthright, because he placed a very low value on what God had given him, his birthright. And that's why Paul wrote in the letter to the Romans, Romans chapter 9, verse 13, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I hated. Jacob understood the value of the birthright. Esau couldn't see past his stomach, which had become his God. The letter, or the writer of the book of Hebrews wrote this warning to us. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 through 17. 
See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. You cannot take for granted, nor can you scorn your God-given inheritance and not be considered profane by the Almighty. It will cost you a lot more than what you give up or what you get in exchange. Do not despise the birthright that God has given you. Today, our young people are selling their birthrights for a bowl of red stew that only lasts for a few seconds when compared to eternity. Because once you eat it, it's gone. And your birthright, your inheritance is spent. What birthright are we sacrificing for a bowl of red stew, Brother Kenny? Although we have many facets of inheritance, for the sake of brevity, I want to list just three important birthrights or three important inheritances that we sacrifice today. And it's getting more and more widespread. We sacrifice eternal life, also known as the new birth. We sacrifice the power to overcome. And we sacrifice, our young people are now sacrificing their gender. How are we selling our birthright? Every time you yield to the pressures of society or to mammon, the god of money, you sacrifice your birthright. I sold my soul to the devil. I know it's a crappy deal. Lisa came with a few toys like a happy meal. Um, because I grew up in a uh, you know, a household where all I ever did was listen to gospel music and my parents are both traveling ministers and so I kind of sang about, you know, what was going on in my life at 15 and that's how I got introduced to the music industry. I swear I wanted to be like the Amy Grant of music, yeah. <laughs> but it didn't work out and so I sold my soul to the devil. The devil exists incarnate and will buy your soul for knowledge you really do sell your soul to the devil when you play the blues it's not there's no nobody has done it is ever happy about it nobody is ever really happy about it why do you still do it why are you still out here well it goes back to the destiny thing I, mean, I made a bargain with it you know a long time ago and I'm holding up my hand what was your bargain to get where um, I am now. Should, should I ask who you made the bargain with? <laughs> with, 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 you know, with the chief, uh, chief commander. On this earth? <laughs> and on this earth and in, uh, and then in a world we can't see. This is the reality and the norm in the entertainment industry. This isn't a fluke or a one-off thing. It is what buys you a name. Your soul is your birthright, and fame and fortune are Jacob's red stew. You won't perish without it, and you will feel satisfied if you get it. You'll feel satisfied for a short period of time, only for a season. But then there is eternity looming huge in front of you. And the sad thing is, although eternity is towering imminently over each one of us, very few are even noticing it rushing in upon us like a pride of land closing in on a stranded gazelle. Let us consider the new birth. The new birth with which gives us eternal life is our inheritance. It is in essence, our birthright. 
I want us to look at two portions of scripture. Revelation chapter 21 and Colossians chapter 1. First Revelation chapter 21 verse 7 and 8. The one who conquers will have this heritage. I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Jesus himself speaking to John on the Isle of Patmos. John was exiled on the Isle of Patmos because he was preaching the word of God. And Jesus came to him when he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And he said to the one who conquers, Jesus said, to the one who conquers. That means we have a part to play in all of this. That means our conduct has everything to do with the outcome. Salvation is lavish upon us, but it is not forced upon us. We either accept and fight for it, or we denounce and don't fight. Because, make no mistake, no one can conquer without a fight. There is a spiritual battle going on all around us and we must engage in that fight if we're going to conquer. The word conquer, the word translated conquer is the Greek word neko. And according to the theological dictionary of the New Testament, it means the word group denotes victory or superiority, whether in the physical, legal, or metaphorical sense whether in mortal conflict or peaceful competition. Either way you slice it, either way you dice it, victory or superiority, it, it means an effort on your part. That the victor, the one who overcomes, the one who conquers, must conquer through fighting, through holding out, through making a stand. And after all you did to stand, stand therefore. It is the same word that Paul uses in Romans chapter 12, verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Paul is saying, do not let evil conquer you. You must conquer evil. You can only conquer evil with good. Therefore, conquer with good. It is the same word that Jesus used to to, to say to the one who conquers, it's that same word in, the word in the verse that we used earlier. So it would stand to reason that Jesus is talking about conquering sin. Yes, that is exactly what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about fighting, a spiritual fight, a spiritual warfare, joining that fight and fighting and conquering and being the victor over sin and over temptation because that is our heritage and we have a part to play in it. Jesus will fight with us. He'll even fight for us, but we must show up to the battle. We cannot sit back and be armchair warriors. We have to get up and fight the good fight. We must keep the faith. We have to keep ourselves pure. I want you to turn now to Colossians chapter 1 verse 12 through 14. It says, Given thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins again we see that the gift of life or the gift of the new birth or the gift of salvation is being described as the inheritance of the saints it is our inheritance god has given us a great and marvelous inheritance found in his son, Christ Jesus, who is the propitiation for our sins. 
But I would never sell my soul to the devil, Brother Kenny. You don't have to draw a circle at the crossroads and walk backwards around the circle three times and then shout the name of Satan and then say it again backwards. Then he will appear and make a deal with you in order to sell your soul. It doesn't have to happen like that. All you have to do is exclude God from your day-to-day -day life or ignore God and despise your birthright. And, and now I'm trying to get a job as a security guard. This is crazy. You know, this is not working out. And I said, I'm done with this thing. You know, I'm going to go back into the, um, into, into the entertainment industry. I still have my connections. I was still receiving phone calls. People still were asking me to do projects. And I was turning them down. But now I said, listen, it's time for me to go back. But when I tried to go back and I tried to write a script, I couldn't get one word out. When I try to sit down and, and to think of a rhyme, it would not come to me. Nothing would come to me. I couldn't get one line out. For, I, for, I couldn't squeeze a line out of, a, out of anything. It was like trying to beat a brick. And then I realized at that point, I said, you know, I know what I need to do. I have to denounce Christ. If I denounce Christ, then that, then that spirit that was in me, prior to me accepting God will come back and I'll be able to um, be successful at my writing and uh, making my music again. The man in the video that just played, he didn't sell his soul. He didn't utter words. He didn't do any of the magic stuff. He simply started living his life like God did not exist or he did not or that God did not matter at all. And that was enough. The next birthright right, that our young people are selling today for a bowl of red stew is the power to overcome. Look at Isaiah chapter 54 verse 17. No weapon that is fashioned against you shall succeed and you shall refute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their vindication from me, declares the Lord. God promised that no weapon formed against us will prosper, that we will refute every word that people will speak against us in judgment because he has given that to us as our inheritance. He has given us the power to overcome. It is a part of our heritage. It's a part of our inheritance. Jesus is promising us the privilege to overcome. That is our birthright. Look at, at, at what Jesus says through John the Beloved in his writing, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 through 5. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. We have a part in this. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who strengthens us or who enables us to overcome. I can do all things through him who strengthens us. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13. But there are more and more so-called Christians that do not believe that Jesus is God, but that God somehow usurped what Jesus, a mere man according to them, did on the cross and is now offering it to us, something that he did not pay for, he did not purchase, but Jesus purchased it with his own blood. Now God is offering it to us. How can he offer something that do not belong to him, according to those people. You cannot call yourself a Christian without the basic belief that Jesus is God. Our birth gender is another inheritance from God who has predetermined each one before the eons of time. And now to say that God has made a mistake and have put us in the wrong body 
is an open and direct insult to him. Not to me, but to God. This is getting close to blasphemy. If not already crossed the line of blasphemy. Our God is perfect in all of his ways. There are no mistakes in him. No errors, no blunders in anything that he does. Everything he does is perfect. Today's George Soros think tank funded society that we live in teach our young people that evil is good and good is evil to their own detriment. They have brainwashed our young men into believing that to be male is to be toxic masculinity or to have toxic mas masculinity. And so they should be more feminine. Then they brainwash our young women into believing that men are worthless and evil and that they don't need a man at all. Therefore, it is in their best interest for them to put on the cloak of toxic masculinity. Because after all, that cloak looks better on them than on a guy. It is our birthright, men, to be men. It is our privilege to be a part of the male gender. Women, it is your birthright and a privilege to be a woman. You are not being discriminated against if a man opens the door for you. You are not being victimized if a man gets up and gives you his seat. It's a gentleman thing to do for a woman, for a lady. This is a privilege that you, as a woman, should accept and appreciate. It is a privilege that every woman should experience and enjoy. That is your God-given birthright. Don't let them deprive you of that. Trust me, that red stew isn't that good. Look at where it has gotten you. Men think twice about treating a woman like a lady. Men think twice about getting up and offering a seat. Men think twice about holding a door. If you see a young lady come in, he'll just close the door. Why? Because he's targeted. He's made to feel ashamed, made to feel like he's just discriminated against her because she's a woman. I'm telling you, that red stew is not that great. I don't believe that your birthright is that little in your eyes. Tell me, it's Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Vision of future for your life and for my life. Is it greater and brighter than the one that God has for you? I don't believe so. I don't believe that their vision for you, for me, is, can even compare because I don't believe that it's very good. It's good for them, but not for us. You will have nothing and you will be happy. Does that sound like happiness? Jeremiah 29, 11, we read it earlier. Let's read it from the NIV. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. God wants you to have stuff. They do not want you to have anything. You will have nothing and you will be happy. God has so much more for us than we will allow him to give us because we have sold our birthright for a bowl of red stew. We choose to believe the lies that we are told and discard the truths that we have been taught. Look around at the chaos in our big cities the chaos that they hide from us, that the news do not cover. Memphis, Tennessee, Chicago, Philadelphia, St. Louis, Milwaukee, Los Angeles, Detroit, New York, big New York City, Oakland, California. The big cities are a constant turmoil, 
fight-ins, murders, robberies, break-ins, carjackings, name it, and it happens every single day in those big cities. It's a way of life for them now. Murderers and gangsters are being set free by these George Soros appointed attorneys, DAs. This is the vision that the WEF and Soros have for us. They don't want peace and law abiding sedentary. They want violence and chaos so that they will have an excuse to lock us all down and take away our rights to freedom and enslave the whole world with they themselves sitting on the top. It is our birthright to enjoy freedom. God our creator did not create us to be enslaved, not even by the financiers and the bankers of the world. Chaos and violence, confusion and dysphoria, disorder and turmoil, unrest and instability, and a general feeling of discontent. That is what they're actually selling, disguised as a bowl of red stew, something that's good for us, something that will strengthen us for our best interests. They have the world so confused and brainwashed that it is praiseworthy for young girls to surgically remove their breasts and for our young boys and our men to get breast implants. And we can't see the contradiction. It's an oxymoron. They're butchering our children by chopping off their God-given private parts and replacing them with the opposite sex, which does not work. It do not work. So why do it at all? It causes more harm than good. And in any places around the world, people are being persecuted and jailed by highlighting the insanity that they're trying to make normal. For instance, there's a lesbian woman in Norway who's facing jail time because she claims that a man cannot be a lesbian. If it wasn't real, it would be laughable. But this is real. This is the world that we're living in. In the Pirates of the Caribbean, Captain Barbosa told Elizabeth Swan, you best start believing in ghost stories, Miss Turner. You're in one. We had best start believing in the days of tribulation because they're fast approaching. We're about to live in one. The scriptures are being fulfilled every single day. The scripture that says, woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. We look around, we see the fury of the enemy. He has launched a full-scale attack, a full-scale war upon us, upon the church, upon anyone with morals, whether they are a believer or a non-believer. If you have morals, if you have any sense of decency, you're a target. I'm telling you, we only have seconds away from the start of eternity. Are you ready to meet the Lord? Are your loved ones ready to meet the Lord? Jesus has given us a birthright and no one can take it away from us. But we can sell it and we sell it very cheaply. For what shall a man give in exchange? For his soul. Or what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world yet lose his soul? Your soul is your birthright. Hold on to your birthright. Do not sell it for a bowl of red stew. I'm encouraging you, each one of you, wake up and start to fight for the souls of your family your spouse, your children, your siblings, your parents, your cousins, your aunts, your uncles. Fight for your loved ones. 
Jesus is coming back real, real soon. Are you ready to meet him? If you're not ready to meet Jesus, let today be the day. Take this, your opportunity to know Jesus. All you have to do is to repeat this prayer after me. Believe it in your heart. This is your inheritance. This is your opportunity to receive your inheritance. Receive it today. If you want to know Jesus, if you want to hold on to your inheritance, inheritance of eternal life, pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Help me, Lord, to live for you. Help me to stand even when the tide is against me. Even when people say all oh, manner of evil against me. Even when things start to go wrong. Help me to stand for you, Lord Jesus. For you stood for me on Calvary. You hung on the cross for me. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. I accept my inheritance that you've given me. Thank you for my inheritance. I accept it, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I would encourage you to do is get a Bible. Begin to read your Bible. Read your Bible every single day. Highlight the verses that are meaningful. Promises. Learn those verses. Learn, learn those promises. Hide it away in your heart that you might not sin against the Lord God, your God. Then find yourself a Bible-believing church, not one of those progressive churches that embraces the things of the world and you can live any way you want and believe whatever you want and you're okay. You don't have a, have a part in this and because salvation is lavished upon you and you can do whatever you want, live however you want. You have no responsibility. Join a Bible-believing church who believes in holiness. Be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining us. The Lord God loves you. Jesus loves you. He's given you his Holy Spirit. And we love you. Thank you for joining. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Holy Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.